want to kick it off. I think we can all really agree that the sleeping giant of women's sport has awakened. And with that, a host of new challenges and opportunities have emerged. I want to pose a question as to how elite women's sport, and more important, more specifically, sorry, football is viewed, both operationally, structurally, fundamentally, and practically. I feel that this question can be better explained with an understanding of how the players envision their football career.
Would modifications to the norm ensure a longer playing career, reduce the chance of injury, or even provide a better standard of play? Tennis and golf have both made changes to accommodate for the way the female game is played, with women fighting out the best of three sets in Grand Slam tournaments instead of five, which is common practice in the male game. Women also receive a 10 minute break between the second and third set if conditions reach a certain humidity. Some might argue that this has displayed overt sexism through inequality of effort. I'm the first person to stick my hand up in the storage support for female athletes' capability of going the distance. However, let's view this through a different prism. Has this format instead assisted in reducing player injury, ensuring player career longevity, protecting players' health and well-being, and maximising player output? The WTA tour itself was built off the back of Billie Jean King, who had the foresight to not only ensure that the best women were all competing on the same circuit, but had a voice through the Women's Tennis Association. This would become the catalyst for change that would lead to equality in pay and the establishment of an active players' council advocating for female player interests, changes in scheduling, and dealing with the current issues affecting the women's game. Golf has made many adjustments to account for the physiological differences that exist between males and females. The golf balls used by female players have a softer compression rating to accommodate for the slower swing speed of female players. There's also a difference in the clubs used by female players, being lighter, shorter and more flexible. Female players also play the course from its shortest length, off the forward tee, in no way making the hole any easier to play, but reducing the hole length by 25% of the male difference. When referencing the difference in physiology and biology that exists between males and females, we can begin to delve deeper and identify the specific health, cha health challenges that exist. Conceptually, these challenges can be allocated into two categories of course. Sex differences, which refer to the anatomical and physiological differences that exist between males and females, and gender differences. These are the sociological, environmental, and physiological influences that affect women's opportunities and access to sport and health services. Furthermore, is acknowledging who is directly affected. This is both current and retired athletes, as these manifestations from sex and gender differences impact both parties to differing degrees. Medical literature suggests that the current and retired athletes' unique health and medical challenges can be attributed in four key areas. Musculoskeletal differences. Non-contact anterior <coughs> ligament damage is 3.5 times more likely in females due to their difference in neuromuscular adaptations and the biomechanics relating to landing techniques. There is promising evidence that these patterns can be prevented or even corrected by participation in ACL prevention and the appropriate strength and conditioning. The duty then lies with those charged with delivering such programs and their awareness of the female athlete's predisposition. Infertility and pregnancy. Intense physical activity contributes to delayed or late onset of menstruation along with cycle irregularity. A leading cause of infertility in women Exercise during pregnancy and transition back post childbirth requires research and professional guidance. Policies and frameworks need to be developed and put in place that educate and protect <laughs> athletes both pre and post pregnancy. The interrelationship between muscular, sorry, between menstruation and exercise. Intense physical activity and delayed menstruation in adolescence prevents the natural buildup of bone density, which is the leading cause of stress fractures and early onset of osteoporosis later in life. Players' training loads need to be monitored and adjusted to account for the short-term and long-term impacts. Body image and eating disorders. There's an increase in these disorders in young athletes. Prevention, identification and management becomes in check during a player's career. AFLW is a live example of the direct and very real ramifications, both from a legal and player safety wellbeing perspective, that can be amplified by failing to account for these unique health and medical challenges. The AFLW is a direct replication of AFL. Changes were made to the model and rules used within the AFL men's competition. However, these changes were made to drive greater match anesthetics 
and not reflect the sex and gender challenges that were mentioned previously. Public available data indicates that there were more injuries sustained in the AFLW than the AFL. This presents an immediate legal and governance obligation for the AFL Commission in the management of the sport and ensuring player safety and wellbeing. Recognising that the cause of injuries sustained among AFLW players goes beyond those that are inherent in the sport but attributed to sex and gender differences. Initiatives to reduce their occurrence lie in player education on injury prevalence, correct execution of core skills and the consequences that come with failure to do so, and ver verifying rules to reduce the number of gratuitous contacts. Players are relying on the governing body to implement the frameworks that reflect the duty of care stemming from careful consideration of female-specific research. So how do we move from amateur to professional? PFA research has shown that the average age of world championship winning teams is 29 years. And on average, elite female Australian players are leaving the game at 25. With this current rate of player churn, how are the Matildas going to host, hoist the World Cup? Australian players have indicated that the main reasons they leave the game early is due to financial strain, lack of professional career opportunities, and to start a family. How do we keep the players in the game, increase the talent pool, and create, meaning, and create a meaningful career for all of those involved? We build a vision in consultation with the players that moves them from amateur to professional and aligns all stakeholders. This vision has three very clear objectives. Becoming world champions, Olympic gold medalists, and launching the best domestic league in the world. To achieve these aspirations, the framework has three core focus areas. A CBA, the redeveloped competition structure, and the sustainable revenue streams to accommodate that. The outcome has been the negotiation of a collective bargaining agreement that has not only built a strong alliance between all parties involved, the PFA through the players and the FFA with the clubs have set the foundation to grow the players' collective hopes of building a professional career as a footballer and give the players a clear voice in what that future looks like. Put simply, professionalism relates to the financial remuneration to players over and above their expenses. However, more broadly, the notion of professionalism needs to consider a range of factors. Employment status, competition structure, the hours of work, the quality of the infrastructure and the player's access to it, the use and exploitation of the player's intellectual property, and the nature and the support of the support personnel that are engaged by the clubs. With the move towards professionalism comes a new level of expectation and accountability on both the club and the players. The clubs, along with the competition administrator, obligations are threefold. To discharge their duty of care for the female players contracted within their competition, the assignment of the ethical and governance standards that they have institutionalised, and compliance with their statutory obligations as employers. In response, the players must honour their contract in its entirety as employees, adhere to the club's expectations, act and conduct themselves in a professional manner. This forms an education piece for the players and the league itself meeting the threshold required to be considered professional. How does the professional pathway look for female players? Do we want what historically exists for male players? <coughs> PFA research shows that the current male pathway is all about targeting them young, getting them into the system and spinning them out. As indicated, they debut at the age of 21, will churn through three or more clubs over the span of their career and have hung up their boots between the ages of 24 and 27. Is that what we want for our female players? When looking at the general population and female player statistics, there is a strong correlation with their academic ability and thirst for education. Women make up 60% of undergrads, girls have consistently higher school grades, Girls focus on process and mastery of skill, and 28% of W League players have completed a master's or bachelor's degree. This then needs to be reflected in the female career path. Can we provide a resource charged with managing this process, finding flexible education and employment options that complement the players' football commitments? Do we restrict access to players to allow 
to hours that allow for them to attend and complete their off-field pursuits? What about those players who just want to be professional footballers? Can we support them and help them find employment by connecting them to international leagues and managing their W League and international careers? With the aim of being to remove the stress of sourcing employment and providing them with a clear career outlook. How do we then ensure that we have the appropriate mechanisms? Oops, I missed something. Sorry. How do we then ensure that we have the appropriate mechanism in place to achieve a female-specific football model? To strip it back further, what do these what do these mechanisms include? The key core drivers are coaching. Sorry. <laughs> coaching. So the introduction of coaching accreditations that require prospective coaches to acquire skills that safeguard the health and well-being of female athletes, such as appropriate training to minimise ACL injuries or training load optimisation to avoid stress fractures in adolescent players. Human performance. The governing body and clubs have to ensure that the rigour applied to biometric data collection within the men's program is equally applied to the female players to ensure that firstly the appropriate level of human performance support to, sorry, to current players is in place and secondly there is ongoing female specific research to support the development of a compulsory framework which matches the needs of professional female players. The competition structure itself does this rep does the replication of the 38 week male season fit in the female game? Or is there a better way of doing it? Does the current structure fit given the smaller playing pool, complementing the existing global domestic league and offering an avenue for players to maximize their earning potential? Can we look for ways to increase the games played without increasing the season length? Are midweek games an option, both from a structural and broadcast perspective? What about dual? Registration, is there value in having players contracted to two or more clubs simultaneously? Does it cut through the bureaucracy and provide the player with job security, peace of mind, and a cyclical employment? Governance and administration. I don't think that anyone here would disagree with the need to ensure that women's football has a voice. But what does that voice look like? And even more important, how is that voice supported? You can't be what you can't see, and with that comes the overriding fact that female administrators, coaches, referees and volunteers are the lifeblood that needs to be injected into football. What is the best way to achieve this? Are gender equity regula regulations within policy documents and quotas the most effective means? Are there other live examples that could be implemented to ensure gender equality? The Rooney, the Rooney Rule is one that stands out. Adopted in 2002 by the NFL to provide opportunity for minority candidates to be interviewed for head coaching and general management positions. This resulted in a percentage of African American head coaches jumping from 6% to 22%. <coughs> the English FA are looking to pilot the rule through their league clubs as only three out of 92 have minority <coughs> coaches, even less so in the Premier League. Variations of the rule have been adapted by other industries to reduce unconscious bias by diversifying both the interview panel and applicant pool when interviewing for key positions. This rule does not guarantee job entitlement, instead ensures a broader candidate pool and a fair chance to all. This is a simple yet effective mechanism that should be applied with our, within our game from grassroots to governance for all decision-making positions. This is such an exciting topic and one that I feel passionate about. We have really only started to scratch the surface as we begin to crystallise these concepts and delve deeper into conversation. The opportunity to build a football model that supports the biology and physiology of females, provides a female voice and involves females within the decision making process can be instrumental in the way that not only women's football but women's sport develops in this country. I'll leave you with the, what exactly can be achieved by reimagining women's
alone after the Matildas defeated Germany 2-1 in that gripping World Cup final. I tell you what, any boss who's actually one of the not turning up the day is a bum. <laughs>